Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Mike Wickers. I'm the mayor of Cottonwood Heights, and this is the Cottonwood Heights City Council business meeting for uh, Tuesday, October 15th. Uh, welcome. 2024. Welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Mike Wickers. I'm the mayor of Cottonwood Heights, and we this do is not the Cottonwood Heights that. City Council business meeting <laughs> for. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You know how you hate hearing how you yourself, how you sound? Yeah. Wow. So are we okay? Okay, we're okay, good. <laughs> we are going to get started this evening by uh, uh, reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, and I've asked our, our city councilman, Sean Newell, uh, to lead us in that effort. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Item number three on our agenda this evening is a public hearing to receive input on the proposed budget amendment for the 24-25 fiscal year. Um, we, we had uh, our, Scott, you wanna come up real quick? Okay. We'll, get, we'll have our financial services director, Scott Jurgis, give us just a brief background on this amendment, proposed amendment. Okay, so um, we do adjust the budget periodically um, over the course of a year. There we go. Okay, um, and some of these items we expect and some of these items um, we don't know what's going to come and so we wait until they come and then we make the adjustment. So the first two items are agreements for, for compensation for already budgeted services that we were expecting and we just didn't know the amount and so now we know the amount and so we're adding the revenues in for that. So the first item is the UDOT agreement for the Canyon Patrol snow equipment, snow monitoring aspect. We added three officers about a year ago to our budget to um, for this and now we're uh, receiving our annual compensation of 180,000 for that. Um, so that will be just a reduction in overall, excuse me, impact to our uh, general fund. The second item is we were receiving uh, $80,000 net for our two school resource officers that we have uh, budgeted to Canyon School District. They've increased that to $75,000. And so that's $150,000 of net revenue. So we can add in the difference, which is 70,000 of revenue. Those are for officers that are already budgeted in uh, the schools with that. Number three is overtime and expenses, uh, overtime expense and reimbursement for the over for the marathon that just occurred a few weeks back, seven thousand three hundred and ten dollars uh, for that, um, and then overtime reimbursement for various requests from local companies. Every once in a while, a company will have something like a construction site or something that they need some uh, security service on, and we provide that, and they reimburse us one thousand nine hundred and five dollars on that. Uh, police DUI and other um, State of Utah Division of Public Safety reimbursed overtime. So this could be click it or ticket, could be DUI, it could be crosswalk enforcement, other things like that. But we have a total of $21,116 of both expense and revenue related to that. Um, this is a police rabies testing for, related to a holiday uh, court, municipal court case. Um, oftentimes on this, we have to pay for a, a service that will then eventually usually get come back to us in the form of a court fine. Uh, it doesn't come directly to us. It goes to the court and helps to offset some of that cost there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, item number seven is a contribution from the Kara Clapp Foundation of $12,000 to, to go towards the purchase of a new canine uh, unit. And this has been talked about in the past and, and we now are realizing that in the budget. Item number eight is a Canine contribution from the Timothy Blair family of $100 to go towards canine um, related expenditures. Um, and then the Historic Committee received a grant from the state of Utah related to the survey of, of historical properties. And that's a $5,000 grant. So again, an increase in expense and revenue on that. 
And then the EDCU gave us a grant uh, for economic development of $500. Mm -hmm. So again, recognizing the expense and the revenue on that. And then a Brighton Youth Football Scholarship Program for uh, various players in the city who um, are not able to afford that, a $2,000 donation to that to allow them to um, have some players play. So overall, we're increasing expenditures $50,111, and our revenues are increasing $297,931 for a net impact on our um, general fund of uh, savings of 247820 um, Moving to the capital projects fund, so each year we are not able to finish our capital projects. When, when we don't finish a capital project, let's just make some imaginary ones up, say it's a million dollar capital project, but we can only spend 800000 before the end of June. Um, the remaining amount would flow to fund balance at the end of the year, and then we need to rebudget that in order to be able to utilize that in the next year. So we take whatever remains and we rebudget that. So there's no new costs that we're talking about here. These are all projects that were budgeted for and funded in prior years that we need to carry forward. Many of these in the capital projects funds are roads related, but there is also a significant amount that's in there for. Uh, the Bonneville Shoreline Trail and other things. So there's six thousand or six million seven hundred two thousand of expense and two million four hundred eighty two thousand of revenue for a net of four million two hundred twenty thousand uh, as we have that rebudgeting moving forward. And then in the stormwater fund, there's nine hundred and thirty two thousand of um, expense that needs to be rebudgeted. And again, all that's related to some stormwater uh, um, projects that are ongoing uh, that crossed our the end of our fiscal year and, are, and are, are going. So that's what I have there and um, I'm, I'm done unless there's any questions. Great, thank you, Scott, appreciate it. <clears throat> so I'm gonna officially open the public hearing. I do not currently have any comment cards on this uh, item. Is there anybody here that would like to comment on the on the budget amendment? This is specific to our proposed budget amendment. Okay, so seeing none, I will uh, close the public hearing and we will move to item number four, which are our city council reports. <clears throat> um, once a month, we give the, the council the opportunity to uh, report on some of the things that they're working on. Um, we're going to begin this uh, month with uh, our, our council member in District 4, Ellen Burrell. Thank you. <clears throat> well, we um, have uh, we have some challenges um, in our district. We have things to celebrate, but we also have um, some uh, challenges along SR two hundred and ten Wasatch Boulevard through District Four, um, based on um, this seasonality this time of year. Um, the last hurrah, apparently, for those who want to come up into. Uh, big and Little Cottonwood Canyon. Uh, the uh, noise levels have been uh, worse than ever, uh, you know, related to vehicular uh, vehicles of all types uh, reaching their top speeds um, as they go through our neighborhoods. And so um, this, is, uh, this is a challenge I'm hearing a lot uh, from my constituents. Um, they... Uh, are interested in slower speeds, which would be commensurate to lesser volume uh, from our roadways. Um, <clears throat> I, I do want to assure my constituents who live in the Dover Hills area uh, that the recent uh, removal of trees uh, there, some of the mature evergreens, uh, uh, two out of the four evergreens that were removed um, were part of the a plan from the beginning, and uh, I have been interacting with our uh, economic development director, and he has assured me that uh, he is working with Ivory Homes and with the construction company that's building the park uh, to rectify uh, that situation. Um, let's see, I uh, am also working with the Youth uh, City Council and I want to really commend them for their ongoing service to our city um, with their um, 
support of the various events that we put on, as well as they put on their own uh, educational and social uh, events, and those are ongoing. Um, the Parks, Trails, and Open Space Committee continues to convene monthly and address uh, a number of aspects that enhance our parks, and I really commend each and every one of the people that uh, participate on the uh, PTOS committee. I also want to commend the subcommittee on active transportation. Uh, they're doing some good, great work, and they're working with staff, and uh, we're pretty excited about the new neighborhood byway. We want to thank the Public Works Department and our director, Matt Shipp, uh, for the building if you, of the first uh, raised crosswalk in association with the neighborhood byway that's located on Banbury uh, Drive, uh, just near uh, where it meets uh, Brighton Way, of course, uh, near Bywater Park. So if you haven't been over to check out that new facility, uh, we're very excited about the safety that it brings and hopefully we'll encourage more of our residents to walk or, or ride uh, to the park. And so that's my report. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Burrell. So from Kent, Council District 3, Councilmember Sean Newell. Good evening, everyone. I have uh, two of the committees that I uh, represent um, on the council that I'm gonna discuss tonight. First one is the Arts Council. Um, there are a number of events coming up here in October. One of them would be the Monster Mash, which is gonna take place October 25th from five to seven. Um, that will be held, I believe, at the Rec, Rec Center, correct? And um, we also have a holiday concert coming up that's actually free on December 6th. But one of the most fun things I want to do tonight is I want to have Whitney stand up. You didn't expect this. <laughs> Whitney has led us in a number of different projects on, on our Arts Council as the artist of, I should say, artist de jour, right? <laughs> um, and right now she's actually doing Hollow Ink, which is a participatory um, online um, drawing event. And she has done so many great things for our community, um, her, her leadership, her willingness to step in is phenomenal. So I want to thank you, Whitney, and on behalf of myself, the mayor, and the council for being here and for all that you do for our city. You may Plus have a seat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. You didn't know that was coming, did you? <laughs> did you? Did you mention that she painted the mural at Mountain View Park as well? Yes. Oh, I, I should have said that. I talked about it the last time we did this, but she was the one that was our artist at uh, Mountain View Park um, for the new... B, I should say, I call it the B, the B mural, but it's beautiful. And if you have a chance, go down there and take a look at it and enjoy our pollinator garden. The other um, um, committee that I'm on is the Canyon School Foundation. The Canyon School Foundation, they actually raise funds to share with all of our different schools. This year, we're donating $93,000 to different classrooms at different schools for different projects that were presented. And we call these scholarship projects. And at the end of um, this month, we'll actually get on a bus as board members for this Canyon Foundation and hand deliver each of these um, awards to each of the teachers in our classrooms. It is a phenomenal thing that they do. The types of things that they're funding are things from like mini bike building, uh, drones, STEM projects where we have materials that go into the classrooms. And the, the individual teachers actually apply for funds and they have, they sit forth, set forth their proposed budgets and we determine it as, a, as an entire board as to what to uh, give them in a monetary fashion. And this is our chance to really celebrate each and every one of these teachers and their students and the work that they're doing for our students in our classrooms in the Canyons District. Then thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Newell. Uh, from Council District 2, Councilmember Suzanne Highland. Good evening. I have three committees that I sit on. One is Emergency Management, another Cottonwood Heights Business Association, and another is the CH2, which is coordinating with the city with the um, Cottonwood Heights Recreation Center and all the events and things that we do together. Um, if you saw the agenda, you know that we did some emergency management training that's always a great reminder to us that hope is not a plan, that we need to be able to be prepared. Um, I was actually recently really 
jolted out of my comfort zone because my uncle lives in Asheville, North Carolina, and they still have no power or water. And it's been weeks and that infrastructure was so heavily damaged. And what was mentioned tonight in our emergency training is we have that level of emergency and help is not coming for a while. So it's a good reminder to me and to you, I don't wanna be henny penny that the sky is falling, but it could. And so let's be prepared. Um, Councilman member Newell mentioned Monster Mash. That is a cherished tradition at Cottonwood Heights. And we're grateful to the Arts Council and also the Youth City Council and all those who contribute to that. And we that's always well attended, it's fun. But I do also wanna mention, because I sit on the Cottonwood Heights Business Association, that there's a trunk or treat on October 31st from three to 4.30. And that if you are a business or know a business who would be willing to set up a trunk for our tr uh, trick or treaters, that uh, you can contact the city and they'd be grateful for your contribution. And then last, uh, it's the 40th year of the Thanksgiving 5K in Cottonwood Heights. And so what a fun way, almost like a punishment type way. Okay, I gotta run before I can eat all that food. So please register early and I won't give you a website. You wouldn't remember it anyway. So just uh, Google Thanksgiving 5K in Cottonwood Heights and you can register and get your turkey trot in the morning of Thanksgiving in our city. That's it. Thank you, Councilmember Highland. And then from Council District 1, Councilmember Matt Holton. Whitney, Mount View Park is in District 1 and you absolutely rocked it. You did such an incredible job and for you to donate all of your time. I don't even know. Do you live in Cottonwood Heights? Okay, I know you have a business here, right? Okay, so both. Well, anyway, thank you so much for doing that. Um, just want to address, we had a conversation earlier in regards to Wasatch Front Waste and Recycling, an increase fee. I just want to let residents know that this is what you pay for today. So today, you pay $19.50 for your black garbage can and your blue recycling can. With that fee, you also get uh, vouchers to go to the landfill. So they gave out 1228 in Cottonwood Heights this last year. I don't think all residents know about this, but you can ask for uh, certain vouchers to go and, and do a drop off. Every January, they come by, if you take your Christmas tree, put it on the curb. This last year, they picked up about 30 tons of Christmas trees, um, and, and that happens all January, so they'll just come by with trailers and pick them up. Um, there is a leaf uh, drop off at Bywater Park where you can take all your bagged leaves, put them in bins there. Um, also, when it comes to glass, you can either get a glass bin, that is an additional fee, but you can take all of your glass that you collect, go to Whitmore Library, and there are bins there to drop it off that is included in your $19.50 fee that you, that you pay. Um, over the last four years, they had an increase of cost to their trucks, as you can imagine, the wear and tear on these vehicles that are just constantly going. Again, my, my garbage day is on Wednesday, but they, those trucks are going every single day to different locations. Um, and that increase of costs has gone up $114,000 per truck over the last four years. Um, as you can also imagine, trying to get staff with a CDL license specifically to go and do trash pickup is a tough job to recruit for. Um, and so they've had some uh, focus, they've had to focus on retention, all of those things with salaries increase uh, to truck costs and inflation and the services they're providing. There's a proposed increase of $5.50 to $6.50 a month um, that the board will be voting on in the next few weeks. So if you have thoughts on that, please feel free to reach out to me. That's all I got, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Holton. Mayor, may I also just to brag a little bit with the is in District 3? Oh, you should move. <laughs> I know a realtor. So uh, I'm just going to take a minute or so and uh, and tell you about uh, one of the... Um, so, so, so Cottonwood Heights, the city, contracts for fire services with uh, an, an emergency services through Unified Fire Authority. And I'm gonna have Riley turn on his microphone because I'm gonna talk to him for a second and have him add to this to this little um, segment. But so uh, this morning, uh, we had a board meeting 
um, and and one of the people that presented was uh, uh, Chief Case, and he is part of a group called what that's under FEMA. Can it's called the uh, Utah Task Force One. So he's part of the Utah Task Force One, and inside that group are 30 members of uh, UFA, so 30 firefighters from UFA, and who else? That's uh, how many deployed. We have probably 100 or oh, so. Oh, okay. That, so we have 100 uh, um, members of, of UFA that are involved in that. Yeah, but it also includes one. like Ogden, Murray, Salt Lake City, Park City, Provo, West Valley, um, I believe, Sandy Draper. So there's nine other departments so that help support that help support force. that Utah task force. So this Utah task force over the past uh, month uh, deployed to North Carolina. And so for it, remind me how many days total 19, 20, yeah, 19 days total, 19 days. They were there assisting the people of North Carolina to remove debris that a lot of their efforts were actually designed in the beginning in searching for survivors that uh, were, were, were stuck, but, but um, removing debris, uh, some of the other things that they did, Chief, do you, do you remember? Yeah, they do a lot of technical rescue type stuff. So they're um, searching cars and rivers under debris piles, collapsed structures. Um, to do that, they had to repel off of a lot of different things that we don't repel off of usually, but bridges and, and getting down into deep, deep river beds and debris piles and just a lot of kind of tricky, dangerous stuff. Yeah. So the reason I wanted to bring this up to you is, is to let you know that Cottonwood Heights played a small part because we contract with UFA of, of helping the people of North Carolina. And, and, and there are other states that were affected, obviously, too. But the devastation was actually unbelievable. Some of the pictures that, that, that we were shown this morning of the struggles that they that they went through from uh, these two, the, the hurricane. Milton, I guess, was the first one. Uh, or Helene was the first. Helene was Milton the first was the one. That's right. One. That's right. Uh, anyway, so uh, I w I'm grateful that we uh, are part of an organization in Cottonwood Heights that, that, that sent people out to help people in a time of need. And I think as a city, we should all feel a sense of pride for it as well. One of the other things that... Uh, that presented this morning. I'm out of time, so actually we're going to move on. I'll, I'll maybe mention that next time, Chief. But it was another great rescue. So anyway, thank you. Okay, uh, and we now have a citizen comment period. Uh, and I'm going to invite our first resident up, which is Runar Bowman. Hi, Runar. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. I was on your uh, website tonight, um, just before coming here. So I'm kind of just um, not really well prepared, but I just thought I'd, I'd speak a little bit about this. Um, I did notice a, a notice for a, a position you guys are hiring, public health coordinator. And it's a granted position, meaning the money supposedly for this position is being funded by grant money, and it's fully benefited. And um, the general purpose it's kind of lengthy. It says, under general supervision of the city manager, serves as the primary staff coordinator of Cottonwood Heights Community Health Coalition, Health in the Heights. The Community Health Coalition is a community-informed, data-driven, evidence-based prevention model used to bring partners together to review data, identify priorities and resources, and implement community action steps. It is structured as a Communities That Care program within the Salt Lake County Health Department. As such, this position will work closely with the Salt Lake County Health Department, as well as key community leaders, faith-based groups, local school leadership, community volunteers, and other stakeholders to develop facilities and implement the goals and objectives of the Health in the Heights Coalition. That tired me out. Um, I like that's That's okay. That's a mouthful. Um, you know, I'd like to kind of know what, um, you know, that... Why is this position needed would be a question. I didn't think we had a health crisis in our community, but maybe I'm in misinformed. I'd like to know, so like, why is it needed? And um, how are we gonna measure success on this position? Um, we're paying this person to do what? Um, you know, I, I think the city, the city council is tasked with the business of running city government. Um, that's, you know, infrastructure, that's services, that's, things of that nature, and yet here we are getting involved in some kind of a health coalition that has 
very vague stated goals and no real you know, problem they're gonna be solving, at least not that they're stating. Um, I, I just find it kind of puzzling that we're going to going down this path. And the real problem I have is that, oh, it says it's only funded for a year with this grant money. Well, you know what's gonna happen. A year's gonna come by, it won't be funded, and yet we're gonna take it on because the, once you start a new city position, it never dies, it never goes away. There, there's no such thing as a city department or a city, city jobs going away. They just don't. They'll be here permanently. So are we gonna take on that additional salary and create this whole new bureaucracy to tackle something that is really not in the, in the best interest of the city in terms of what, our, what, we're, what the council is supposed to be focusing on? I view it as kind of a wasted, wasted time and a waste of money um, because it will cost us money. There's no doubt about that. And I'd like, to, I'd like to be curious to know what happens in a year if it's not funded. Are you guys going to fund it? Thank you. Thank you, Runar. Uh, so I'm going to have staff reach out to you this week, Runar, um, with, with an explanation of some of it. The money came from uh, the, the big opioid, opioid settlements. And, uh, and, and for this position to continue, it would need to be funded um, anyway, but the, you, you raised some good points and I'm going to have staff come reach out to you with the, more details about what they are specifically tasked, what they will be tasked with doing. But I think it, I think it was a fair question. So uh, the next person I have is Nick Oliphant. Hi, Nick. Hi, Nick. How are you doing, guys? Um, my name's Nick Oliphant and I've lived here in this wonderful community most of my life. My wife, Whitney, and I are proud to call this Conlon Heights our home, and we're deeply invested in its continued success. I'm here to, to re oh, excuse me, guys. I've been speaking all day. <laughs> I'm here today to respectfully request that the city consider allowing residents in single-family zoned areas offer short-term rentals, specifically those who retain their home as a primary residence. I believe this would be a positive change for many families like mine who love the community and we want to continue living here while contributing to its vibrancy. The City Council has been uh, discussing requiring short-term rentals be owner-occupied and I fully support this and I'd like the opportunity for families like mine to license part of their home for short-term rentals during ski season as a way to supplement our income. For many residents, this would be a critical support. We have an aging population who could benefit from this. Extra resources could allow them to stay in their homes longer. Similarly, younger families like mine are feeling the financial pressure of today's economy. And supplemental income from short-term rentals could help con us continue living here in the city that we love. For my family, the city's more than just a place to live. It's where we engage actively in the community, which you guys all stole my thunder about what Whitney has done here lately. My wife, Whitney, owns and operates a small business in Conlon Heights called The Smartest Artist, where she fosters creativity in the community. We also support and volunteer for the local art council. Butlerville Days contribute to elementary art programs uh, and she completed that beautiful mural, which I'm so proud of her, to enhance our public spaces. Our involvement in the city runs deep, and we truly want to continue being part of what makes Conlon Heights special. Um, one way to ensure responsible, or I want to stress that we are dedicated to doing this the right way. We're not looking to become a nuisance to our neighbors or in the community. In fact, We've already successfully operated a short-term rental in Sandy City, adhering to the regulations without any issues. One way to ensure responsible management to short-term rentals would be require owner occupancy. And we're happy to provide proof of residency to show that we're invested in this community. We're asking to be able to make affordable living in Conlet Heights while maintaining our deep roots. For us, short-term rentals are more than a financial solution they allow me to keep my family connected, hosting extended for the holidays. So uh, in summary, we love the city. And we're asking for the opportunity to continue being contributing member members and to allow short-term rentals in single families on areas. 
Thank you, Council. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate your words. Yep, and, and that's a topic of discussion in the next few months. So, Randy Long. <laughs> Hi, Randy. Hi. Yes, my name is Randy Long. I live at 8610 Kings Hill Drive. And I'd like to speak on saving Deathsmith Canyon. That canyon, of course, is, across the pro is one that trail crosses private property at the beginning, as a lot, just as a lot of trails do. Even ones in the forest, forest service land do. That's due to private inholdings. And even national parks have some. In Utah, Zion National Park has two or three, and Capitol Reef has at least one. So again, we need to save Death Smith, save Death Smith Canyon, do all we can to save it. Make so the owner, well, possibly can't close it off. And again, there's several other canyons around that are the same way. Hughes Canyon's that way, and well, Tolcats Canyon, the land's been granted there, but finally, and well, maybe Death Smith, maybe that, maybe it, so that land can be granted too. I don't know. It'd be nice if we could, but again, we need to do something to save it. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Okay. Um, I, that's, do we have any uh, comments online we need to submit, Derek? No, we didn't get any before the deadline today. Okay. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and close the citizen comment period. We're going to move to item six on our agenda, which are two different standing quarterly reports that we do each quarter that will begin with our uh, police department report. And I think our police chief, Robbie Russo, and support services manager, Candy Terry, is going to take care of this for us. Hi, guys. Can I first correct and tell them it's Candy Smith? Oh, she was recently married. Well, congratulations, Candy. Okay, um, we will get started. Oh, sorry, I'm impatient. I apologize. Okay, so for the month of September, um, our calls for service did decline a slightly. We do have uh, 1431, and for our on-view calls, we do have 317, but the decline is normal for September. Because kids are back in school? Yes. Well, and people are still trying to enjoy the end of summer, and they're getting out and about. These are our calls for service by district. Here are our response times. They are up a little bit from last month. However, again, that is normal just due to um, the our um, calls for service going down. And then we did have several officers that were in training and out of the office for the month of September as well. Um, here is our crime stats. We did have a total of 43 overall, five assault, five burglary, 31 theft, and we only had one stolen auto. So we are down from last year. As you can see, our arrests also um, did decline. In September, we did have 39 adult and two juvenile. Traffic citations, we had 269 and 141 warnings, and then we did have three DUIs. So last year, um, this it was down just a little bit, however, because we had two of our traffic officers in a two-week training and one was gone to a conference. So 
it was kind of a sporadic month and a hectic month. So that's why we're down just a little bit this month. So you will see October will go right back up. Do you know, do you know what the numbers were for um, that time last year? Is that, that was your question, right? I don't. I didn't run it for last she, year. She was asking what kind of impact the traffic officers make. So I can, yeah. So I, I usually just run it every month. I don't go back on traffic citations. I can if you'd like that information. How about we do that, Sue? So I just on, the only thing I go back on the year for is the overall crime. And that's the only one I collect from year to year. But I think we will um, do it so you can measure the success of, of the unit so you can actually chart how they compared to a time when they weren't working. I, I think that was your question, right? As we're going. Okay. I, was, I, I thought it came from you. Yeah. I'll send it to Jared and I'll ask Jared to check it out. Thank you. Here are our accidents. Accidents are up. You'll continue to see a trend as we start into the snow month. 43 property and 11 injury. Our code enforcement animal control. We did have two attended and two unattended deaths this last month. And then here is our three months in review. Here is a heat map of all of the property crimes for September. As you can see, District 1 has Always the hot spots down there. Andy, you don't have to say that out loud. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Target and Home Depot. District 1, District 2. And then these are all the citations in the areas that were issued. And let me jump in here on that. Um, when you look at the heat map, it's representative of our city. When you compare that uh, valley wide, and we do that actually because we have a team that goes out with a countywide team that uh, targets areas where there's um, high crimes or they look for fugitives. They put the heat map up and Collin Heights doesn't actually even appear. Um, on the valley wide heat map. So, although it'll appear because we do it locally, and you'll see some spots that are orange or red um, in comparison with the rest of the valley, we really don't even um, compare. So, can I ask a question about that slide? Go back. Oh, was there just no speeding on Creek Road in Danish and Wasatch, or is it just not patrolled? Creek Road. Well, I just see the red. It just seems like really seems creek. So even though so they are on the east side of creek. It speaks east side the blue. They're just not deep red because that that means that there were less than twenty or so citations issued. So there is the blue green on Wasatch. So citations were issued, hmm. it's just not as many as down in this area. Well, you see, I mean, the most read, of course, is Bengal Highland, yeah. Fort Union, over in the Union Park area. Yeah. So my question is just, is that more more patrolling, more just more cars? It's just by nature of the... Yeah. The, okay. Right, I mean, more cars, more... Right, and the higher chance of accidents and injuries. Um, and and bad behavior. So they might, they watch the main arteries a little closer. That does not mean that we don't go out to individual neighborhood complaints and aggressively um, handle those issues when they occur. Yeah. 
uh, well, they, they designate fault on it, but first of all, it wasn't a high speed anything. It was a left turner that um, made a left turn in front of another motorist and caused the accident. There was no indication whatsoever that the other motorist was uh, speeding or not traveling the designated speed limit. So um, they designate a prime contributor and it can't uh, tell us initially whether a citation was issued or not because um, they can issue a warning or they can issue a where one where they appear in court. The important thing is that they designate a prime contributor for the insurance reasons and there were no injuries on that accident by the way. You recall, uh, we're pretty proud of this. Um, you helped us and uh, Shane um, tweaked the ordinance for us on nuisances and we brought it before you and you passed it and then we brought you an amendment to um, clean up some language and you passed it again. This is one house um, and it's important to note that we don't initially take this aggressive in approach. We try to get people into voluntary compliance. But when that doesn't happen, we have to step it up and that means citations or um, something more aggressive. In this case, this individual who lives on 27th East, I've actually heard from most of you on, on this, and I've certainly heard from the people who live around there. Um, this person, we've tried to bring in compliance. We've tried to find remedies for him. We've offered assistance. We've even went so far, far as to have warrants issued and book this person in jail to no avail. So because the um, uh, wording in the, in the ordinance allows us to clean up the property. We did just that. We served them a notice when he failed to comply one last time after seven years. And I have to give Matt's uh, crew a shout out because um, we uh, maintain the property and, and the, the piece and his crew went in. And I think there were 12 dump truck loads. 11. 11. No, there were 14 dump trucks. Yeah. And you can see it. It, it really does not even do it justice. But we the picture up there... And it, citizens would come by and want their picture taken with us um, because they were just so proud of that house being cleaned up. And, you know, they, they just came out and they watched and found a reason to walk by and, and um, engage with us. But it was actually really refreshing, refreshing and satisfying to be able to clean that up for um, those neighbors. I mean, imagine, um, you know, if you live behind it or next door to it, how that would impact your life. And other than, you know, a few rats and a raccoon, um, running away after they moved the debris. There was no real instance, although the homeowner wasn't completely satisfied. But what happens now? So Matt um, has given um, an accounting of what his uh, costs were, and the police department's given their costs, and we'll give them over to Mr. Jurgis's unit, and he'll provide a bill to the homeowner. Um, I fully expect him not to pay that bill, and which time will lean the property. So when they attempt to sell it, that we're first in line. So. Awesome. <clears throat> there, there are more of these in the in the city. So we'll go to the next one and do the same thing. Now that we know, have some experience with it. We've got Halloween coming up in a couple of weeks. We've just got a couple of safety tips here. So um, make sure you're out looking for kiddos. Um, we'll and she's going to go to questions. But before that, let me just because we won't have a chance to see you for for a minute. I, they, we've had a several. Um, high profile issues in the city in the last few weeks. So I just I wanted to talk about in the parameters that I can, you know, we uh, we had a homicide that's that you're aware of. Today, the district attorney's office filed uh, charges on that case. And uh, we can provide that that sheet to you with the list of charges. Uh, but there's more to come. It was very complex and detailed investigation, something that we don't normally see here. And this was a very unique situation. But uh, the guys work around the clock every single day. Many hours went into it, but they were able to uh, culminate it with an arrest. And I think uh, um, we'll continue to progress. And, you know, this is a particularly uh, impactful because there were three uh, minor children um, who uh, um, lost a father and their mother has been criminally charged. Um, another... Uh, Councilmember Burrell issued, or mentioned uh, uh, bicyclist accidents. Yesterday we had a auto bicycle accident on uh, Highland and Fort Union or Bangle and Highland. Uh, that's currently under investigation. Can't talk too much more about that until the 
the crash team issues their findings. But we also had an armed robbery at three o'clock this morning at uh, Maverick. Uh, this person has committed, or this team has committed other robberies, uh, including one last night. They went in with masks and they had a getaway car driver and the one goes in with an AR-15 rifle and uh, holds up the, the clerk and left. But the mistake was that he actually did that in Conwood Heights, so he got caught. And we chased him into South Salt Lake where they bailed out of the car, went over fences and threw the gun. But uh, we got a lot of help from around the valley, including the aircraft and our drone program. Then we took both of them into custody. Um, and I, I, I will mention that uh, at least one of them is uh, a, a gang member that was undocumented that moved across the border into our city. So if you think that your lives are not impacted, um, they are. We see a lot of this. Which one, oh, what, which one am I missing? Um, <laughs> okay. Well, well, I'm gonna take the, take a second, Chief, to uh, commend you on the, uh, the investigative work that I know that, that happened with that homicide. I, I, I know um, that uh, uh, people were unbelievably Im un impressed with all that uh, our department did to make sure that they did things the right way and got the type of evidence that they needed and that they uh, um, did everything so that this person could be charged um, correctly and not have anything, you know, uh, get, allow them to get off. But I, so I've been told multiple times by other people that this investigation was done at the highest level. And so thank you for uh, your staff and everybody who put in so much time on this. Well, thank you. We, we have some very seasoned experts in the area that came from the larger departments who've done several of these cases. It was not new to them. You know, people associate Conwood Heights as being, you know, a, a mid-sized department or small department, but we have the expertise of those big departments. And we have young guys who were given the opportunity to um, learn so we can plan for succession as well. Um, and that case continues and we'll just <coughs> leave it at that. I actually just had a quick question. You may not be able to tell me, but the three children are in safe. Three children are in state custody. State custody. Thank you. And I can explore that more with you after. Well, thank you, Chief. Appreciate it, Candy. Thank Thanks. you, Candy Smith. <laughs> okay. Uh, the the next standing quarterly report is for our public works department. So we'll invite our public works director, Matt Ship, up. Hi, Mayor and Council. Thank you. Um, so tonight, what I thought I'd do, since I'm the, I guess the cleanup act here tonight, I won't take everybody's time, but I would wanted to uh, share a little bit about the things that we've accomplished this fiscal year and all the projects we're wrapping up. I know we've talked a little bit about it. And over the over the past few meetings, um, but I want to take a chance at this opportunity to brag about my staff and the work that they've done to make this happen. So, just on our quarterly report, this is going to be a lot of engineering projects that are happening. Um, there we go. Okay, we finished prospector drive reconstruction. Just some statistics, if it means anything to you, about eighteen thousand square yards of asphalt, uh, about 7,000 feet of curb and gutter, um, driveway and flat work, meaning sidewalks, about 8,000 feet, and, oh, sorry, of uh, flat work and, and driveways, and then about 10,000 square feet of sidewalk. A lot of work went on in Prospector. It's rebuilt. Um, we've had a lot of uh, good, good uh, input from that, from the residents about the contractor and uh, all the work that was done up there, and we want to pre we want to once again thank the residents in that area for their patience. This was a hard one, one way in, one way out, with a lot of homes that we had to deal with, and a lot of cul-de-sacs. Um, we also did the town. We called it the town drive reconstruction. We tend to lump everything together with one road, but town drive included town drive, town circle, Canterbury Lane, and Tony Circle. To give you an idea of what it looks like, you can see a couple of the pictures. It's new, um, 
the new surface, the waterways, and everything that went in. Um, once again, if you're a statistical nerd or you keep track of these things, about 7,200 square yards asphalt, 3,900 feet, 4,000 feet of curb, about 5,000 square feet of driveway, then sidewalks, and then uh, waterways. So we did a lot of uh, stormwater work up there off of 27 in this area as well um, to try to relieve some of those problems that are going on with stormwater. Um, we now have a sidewalk with the finalization of this that connects from 27, I mean from Bengal Boulevard um, all the way down to uh, Canterbury on the east side with our last federal aid project and as well as the completion of this at Tony Circle. So we are that's been completed. Um, as we all are aware, most of you were there at the opening, I believe all of you were. The Hawk signal was installed. This was a federal aid project. It was not an easy project. It uh, caused a lot of problems along the way, but uh, a big thanks goes to Wasatch Front Regional Council for allowing us to move this project ahead a year from what it was uh, originally, we wouldn't be working on it till this year, to be honest, uh, next year, um, if it was on the schedule. But we were able to do that, and this is the Hawk signal um, at Bella Vista Elementary School and uh, Fort Union. You've all seen it, it's functioning. We've stopped and talked to the crossing guards there. They, they absolutely love it, and they enjoy having it there, and they feel a larger measure of safety because of it. Um, uh, I just pushed that button twice. Just a picture to show you what it looks like. The striping's down, the school crossings are there, and uh, we're, we're excited to uh, have it functioning. Um, we did a lot of Cape Seal work um, to date, October 15th. We put about 1.9 million square feet down of Cape Seal, meaning we put down 1.9 million square feet of slurry as well as a chip seal. So a lot of work went into that. And the roads we did were Fort Union, 1300 to 30th East, Highland Drive from Bangle to Creek Road, 1300 East to I-214. Not sure where that is, but uh, I'll, I'll search that out. So that's probably where all of our chip seal went to Union Park. Um, note to self, do a quick review. Uh, and then uh, Bangle Form. Wasatch to City Hall. So we did Bengal Boulevard, so we did all of those those roads. We did our major roads. And the Cape Seal, just so you're aware, is about 95 cents to a dollar a square foot. If we were to have to tear up any of these roads to do a full reconstruction, if we let them get to that point, such as um, Prospector and those roads, we're about nine to ten dollars a square foot at this point. So it is a huge difference that we maintain on a, on a continual basis, which you as a council have allotted these things, that we're maintaining these roads. To reconstruct Fort Union, if you want to go on Google Earth and do a little bit of the math, it's an astronomical number to reconstruct it. So therefore, we're, we're doing these heavier seal coats to protect the road. How long does this seal coat last? This, what are your these thoughts? will get you about seven to 10 years before you need to do it again. Um, that doesn't mean we're not crack sealing between now and then. Cracks, cracks will always reflect up through. If there's a crack there, it will find its way through the asphalt. But in about 10 years, we'll do it again. We did Fort Union about eight years ago with a chip seal, um, and we, now we're doing it again and we're moving through that. I guess yeah. we have short memories, but I, there were a lot of disbelievers, and then after it was all done, you didn't hear from anybody anymore. So it was actually turned out even yeah. better than I imagined it could. Yeah, the Cape Seal, I mean, it is a rough, slurry seals and chip seals are a rough product when they go down. There's no doubt. But travel on those roads, on those is what smooths it out. Even the chip seal eventually smooths itself out. But we went ahead and did the Cape Seal, which capped the chip right away. And like I said, we had a few problems on Fort Union. Quality control wasn't there. The contractor realized, well, we pointed out and the contractor rectified the problem with to no extra cost to the city. So, and it is now fully up and running. Matt, let me ask a question real quick. Yeah. So on our border roads like Union Park mm -hmm. and Creek Road, if we were to, to do anything with those, would we 
request uh, uh, splitting the cost with Sandy and uh, Midville? Yeah, those are uh, those. Yeah, they would be joint projects. And the issue, not the issue, but getting the two to agree on what type of treatment is important. When we stripe those roads, generally speaking, I won't just stripe our half of the road. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We'll we'll stripe both sides. Sandy also, um, along when the county was there, did some work for us in other places. So it was a quid pro quo. We back and forth on a few things. But um, yes, we, thir 30th East, just a couple of years ago, we did one with uh, with our neighbors on 30th East and they split the cost half and half. And so it's, it's uh, kind of a, everybody matching their budgets to work at the same time. We are in communications though. Okay. Okay. Um, my staff wanted me to make sure I showed this to you. They're very excited about their GoPro. So this is Bangle Boulevard. They wanted me to show it in real time, but I said, I can't do that all night long. So anyway, there we go. We're at the end. So this is where the new project will start, by the way. That's why it's not Cape Sealed over here. Oh, no, I don't know how to change. Okay, Banbury Road. Um, you've heard a little bit about this tonight. This is the crosswalk um, on Banbury Road. It is a raised crosswalk. It has uh, RRFBs, um, Rapid Reflecting Flashing Beacons. It's a real wonderful uh, name, saying it fast, but it's an RRFB. Um, we have signs. It's raised all the way across. Um, it was placed in this location as, a, as one of our first ones because it was the least cost because of the stormwater issue. If you look at these, you'll notice that the curb and gutter this goes all the way up to the curb and gutter. So if we didn't have that, we'd have to do a storm drain system and figure that out. But at this point, it's really a high point in the watersheds, um, both uh, east and west. Oh, no. Um, it sheds east and west. So um, this is uh, what went in, and this is somewhat of the final product. You can see the features that we want in the in our crosswalks for pedestrian safety or at least in the park areas i think this is a great reminder to people driving in the park in the area by the park that they are in a location such as this we have trees in the tree wells this has been filled in today actually with the uh, material raised crosswalk signs striping um, we will investigate and at the retreat we'll talk about another of this to the east as we've had that discussion but it's been well received by the residents and we completed the uh, the sidewalk as you can see over here as well on the south side along the cemetery property so that sidewalk is completed all the way through that is there um, we did creek road you've heard a little bit oh, about hold on this. I have a question yeah. Back oh, up. Just so, curiosity, what kind of trees are they and how fast will they grow? Oh, gosh. Now you're going to ask me the question, aren't you? Well, I mean, it, it just had Give people ask, trees. like, how quickly, especially because we want tree lined streets, like, how quickly can we? Before you start, those what I understand and what I've done, I'm not an arborist by any stretch of the imagination. We 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 use the larger trees, we use the two inch calipers because. You can get the three quarter to one inch calipers. They're very small and wispy. We wanted something that made a statement right away, so we right away, so we went ahead and did the two inch caliper. Generally speaking, it, before you start seeing any real growth in something of this size, I'm told it's about five years before it really you start seeing the growth. So then it takes off. I forget golden something. Golden One of the Creek. things I hope that we consider going forward is, is um, you know, having a committee that, that is about sustainability and the importance of native plants, uh, plants that uh, are, will not require uh, watering beyond the first one to two years of their life. And so if we're setting standards for what will be in future neighborhood byways and in park strips, uh, I highly recommend that the council 
uh, really give thought and and uh, just as as uh, council member Highland has suggested a a short term rental committee, I would like to really recommend that the city uh, support our public works department by you know having a citizen committee that can recommend native plants and we can be a model for sustainability uh, to to the other cities in in Salt Lake County. So Matt, I, I would also add, so we're going to keep the tea trees hopefully trimmed up a ways just so that, yeah. so that cars, the, I, they won't the, get stuck behind, you know, or I want them to be able to be seen, the people. That yeah, are it, the idea behind this it, that we've talked about is canopy lined. Um, we do, in our ordinance, we do have trees that are allowed in park strips that we have in our ordinance, and this is considered in one of those. As these trees grow, it's really an odd shape as you keep working it. Uh, it looks like a popsicle as you keep going up till it finally starts to canopy out and it's high enough above the road. But this is, yeah, we'd have to keep it. There's a lot of uh, work that'll have to be done to shape these trees when they start taking off, if you will. Great. Um, once again, Creek Road, storm drain, we've talked a little bit about this. That project is complete. This is the home at the bottom of the hill. You can see that these three storm drains during the last big storm did not see a whole lot of water because we picked up a lot from both sides, but it's there. It's a safety measure, and uh, just wanted to bring that up. And Cory Hill Circle, this is one that uh, we talked about, I believe, at the last retreat, if I recall. Um, this was the waterway. You can see it right here, what it looked like. You can see all the scrapes and everything that, uh, that went along with that. So we removed the waterway and installed a storm system underneath, replaced the sidewalk and um, these types of things. And now this is the new product. You can see the waterway's gone. Uh, residents have been extremely happy with this, as I'm sure the delivery drivers are as well, as no one's having to pull their trucks out of the uh, out of that. And then uh, this is the 1700 East sidewalk project. It is still under construction, but the sidewalk on 17 is complete. They're finalizing the cycle track on Fort Union, and they're working on that asphalt. Um, they're looking at. Uh, where we're looking at final completion of the whole product by November 15th. And this is the, so, oh, I was on, oh, this is the cycle track, I'm sorry. This is the cycle track completed by November 15th. It's part of the same project, I apologize. And then the 1700 East sidewalk is completed again. And uh, this seven, it goes from Fort Union up to, to 7200 south and it's a complete sidewalk on the west side of the road and it also traverses um, west down 7200 south to tie the sidewalk in completely any feedback council member holton on that yet oh there's a lot of people that are excited of course you do hear a couple residents that complain about light lamp posts and other things and i just continue to encourage them to let the folks do their job and finish it i'm sure that matt will get it correct when it's all done but uh it's it's a tough process for the for the people that live right there but in the end it's beautiful project and they're going to enjoy it so the residents along here have been great they really have they've worked well with the contractor but yes if anytime you're doing this kind of work you are gonna you're gonna inconvenience people there's no getting around it so um uh, Supernal Drive, this was an emergency repair. This is a uh, storm drain that actually was about just FYI, and then I'll finish up about 15 feet down. It broken, and over the years, it just kept washing underneath a home or underneath a porch home next to a home until finally this year it just fell in. It just dropped about eight feet, uh, just gone. So the backyard was completely destroyed and there were a lot of problems and we, uh, we've gone in there and worked this out. It's been great. The, the owner of the home has been absolutely wonderful, a great person to work with. I think it was easier on them because they're back in Vermont for, uh, for the summer. 
but they come back in about three weeks and we've been in constant communication with them. And that is the end of what we wanted to present tonight. Are there any questions about any of the projects? Well, let's see, the only one I, I didn't see you present on was the Creek Road, all the extensive work that was done on the hill, I believe it's Pepper Hill. That was quite a job yeah, for your crew. That was intense. Yeah, the stormwater project. Yeah. Yes. That yeah. Was, yeah, that was a major that was a major project for the city to, like I said, to help take care of that home at the bottom and all the flooding that's occurred. Yeah. Yeah. Well thank you for all of yeah. those. Thank Matt, you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate all you do. Thank you. So our last item on our agenda is just approval of our consent calendar, which is our minutes for the city council work session and business meeting for September 17, 2024. Could I get a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll make that motion to approve the consent calendar. A second. We have a motion to approve and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you.